who were well known for their basket weaving and beadwork uh, here in the lands. And today's talk is going to be on something that is very basic, fundamental, the aspect of clinging. Um, and especially with what we're seeing in society today, <laughs> a lot of clinging happening in social media and media and politics and thought it would be a really relevant conversation for us. And we're gonna have a bit of meditation to just set the space, a little bit of discussion or Dharma talk and to close off a bit of meditation and a bit of Q and A towards the end. Um, and just for myself to share a little bit of my work and what I do now, um, I was running a few organizations a year, uh, a few years ago uh, around design, meditation, um, and lately it's become more of an integrated practice. Uh, myself, I run a design agency, but also a nonprofit empowering queer BIPOC creatives to break into the design sector. And mindfulness was its own separate nonprofit, but it's become more of a meditative slash integrated practice where we bring uh, concepts like what we'll show today and these aspects of um, mindfulness or topics of self-awareness and community awareness into our work, especially as tech and design is uh, digital design specifically is becoming more integrated into our lives more than ever. And so as we just start to settle into the space, I kind of want to start with a short meditation exercise. And so with that, um, see if you can bring yourself to a nice, comfortable, gentle position. If you need to turn off your video camera uh, so that you can focus, feel free to do that. But if you also want to leave it on, I will leave it on as well so we can also see each other digitally and be in community. Um, if you are sitting on a chair, See if you can uncross your feet and just allow both feet, if you have access to them, to plant directly into the ground, uh, allowing the soles of your feet to caress the floor. Um, and then with your eyes, if you want to bring it to a gentle close or gentle looking down, feel free to do so. Your hands, feel free to settle them wherever you'd like. And with your posture, just bring yourself to a nice position that is comfortable to you or you have access to if you're sitting on the floor, um, wherever you are, just nestle, nestle, nuzzle, <laughs> all parts of your legs, your butt, wherever you're comfortable. And what we like to do in our practice is just imagine you have a, a piece of rope starting at the tip of your tailbone, traveling all the way through the length of your spine and sprouting at the top of your head. And imagine that's being pulled ever so gently to feel your spine elongate upwards and see if you can also tilt your head up just 10, 15 degrees and countering a little bit of the looking down we do all day long, whether it's on our phone, our laptop, computers, keyboards. And we are now in a beautiful posture for meditation to set the space. And what we like to do is observe a few breaths in and out as a group to set the intention digitally, remotely, wherever we are, breathing in. Breathing out. Releasing a bit of tension that you're holding on to, breathing in with a bit of intention, gentleness, breathing out, allowing yourself to sit in deeper into the position that you're in. One more breathing in. Filling your lungs, and as tension arises, breathing out, <sighs> releasing, and settling in. 
And for this short meditation exercise, as you settle into your breathing and finding a cadence that works best for you, not having to force a cadence, wherever you feel tension, breathing in, release, breathing out. And as soon as you feel tension, breathe it back in and allow this practice to be gentle as we start. Bring a bit of curiosity to what is happening. Where is the breath moving in and out? Is it through your nose? Is it through your mouth? Is there sensations arising where the breath is entering in and out? Or maybe thoughts are breathing in and out. Are there thoughts arising? And are there also thoughts dissolving? And with a bit of gentleness, with whatever's arising, see if you can greet it with a bit of compassion, curiosity. Maybe a smile. We hold so much seriousness through the day and maybe there's a bit of joy and ease that we can bring into this practice today. Maybe this is our first bit of meditation that we were able to do today to check off that box and with it a bit of exhilaration, joy. Ha, ah, I did it. <laughs> Or maybe this is your second or subsequent practice today to just allow a bit of grounding to show up through you. And with that, we're going to take a few breaths in and out to bring us back into our space. Breathing in and the gentle breath out. Gentle breath in and a gentle breath out. And one more gentle breath in and a gentle breath out. And with it, bring a little bit of a wiggle movement, maybe your toes, your fingers, fluttering your eyes open. Welcome back into the space. And as I introduce a talk, feel free to give yourself a bit of movement, massage, a bit of stretch as well. And sometimes if that was our first meditation practice of the day and we just got to sit into it, maybe we feel a bit of stretching, a bit of stretching is calling us, a bit of rotating of our neck and just, oh, just allow that. Yeah, maybe a yawn is coming up and just allowing things to show up and process through our body. And this beautiful exercise of meditation, whether it's one minute or five minute, sometimes allows a bit of movement, thought, uh, processing to transpire. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, today, we'll be talking a bit about the aspect of clinging, aspect of holding on to things. And what I want to start off is this aspect of clinging and holding off is so natural and innate to us, right? And as we sat in the meditation immediately, this practice shows up as how we're sitting in things. You know, this is how I've meditated, so I'm going to sit directly into it, right? And also maybe thoughts. This is what I've been thinking all day, right? Ah, oh, this has been bothering me. I've been holding on to this thought. And it's also coming up in meditation again, right? Or just things that you're like, oh, I remember I was supposed to do that during meditation. Or ways that we were practicing things that is 
coming up as the way that we are trying to, we carry so much of that. And that is in our learned experience, right? And maybe our lived experience transcends that. We have memories, we have thoughts that transcends ancestry. We have things that we carry that we might not even know that we carry as a part of just lineages that we uphold. And as a part of this exercise, isn't to solve or to get rid of this practice, but today what I invite is just an open-ended curiosity and open-ended awareness to just become aware and to be friends with whatever it is that's coming up for you today. Um, this book I've been reading recently that I absolutely love, uh, the author is Stephanie Fu, an Asian American author of What My Bones Know, writes how every cell is filled with this codes of generation of trauma, death, birth, migration, and history of something that we sometimes cannot understand just peaceful moments of things that we carry through with our ancestors over the years and understanding ourselves is also understanding um, what our bones know, what we have awareness for. Beautiful, beautiful book. Um, I'm going to just pop that into the chat as repository for us. One sec. There we go. And so the question, right, the million dollar question for all of us, why do we cling onto stuff? And why do we attaching so much to our stuff? And why I also like this as a practice, especially in Buddhism, is Buddhism 101. It is usually typically the thing that we're taught immediately, right? And we're, we're taught that this aspect of clinging, this aspect in Pali called upadana brings us ultimately this pain, this demise onto us, otherwise known as dukkha. And this attachment, this relationship that we build with concepts, and when they're not met, when it isn't what we expect, ultimately brings us this sadness, this disposition, this pit of despair that ultimately brings us away from this aspect of enlightenment. And this aspect of also clinging, we attach a bit of insight to it, right? And we sometimes have this awareness of, oh, I want to cling because it's going to bring us happiness. I want to cling because it brings us familiarity, comfort. And sometimes we are more attached to what we think the clinging brings and the actual clinging itself. And sometimes the clinging is to theoretical aspects of the past or the future of us. And I want to first start off with maybe these aspects of fundamental things that we cling on to. And so in typical Buddhism, they'll talk about the first aspect, right, which is the clinging of central pleasures, uh, clinging on to things that we sense that we become enamored with things that sometimes we become so enamored with what we become habituated with. And when we become outside of the things that we become enamored with, this is where Buddhism says we are clinging a bit too much. Sometimes things are too hot. Sometimes things are too cold. They're uncomfortable. When you're sitting in meditation, uh, uh, this isn't feeling too good. Um, Goldilocks, right, is quite an expert <laughs> of sensual pleasures. It's too hot, uh, it's too cold, too big, too small. Um, and sometimes here in New York City, I feel as though I'm always sitting with this practice where I'm like, it's a little too loud. <laughs> Uh, there's too much noise. Um, but sometimes in New York City, I'm like, oh, it's too soft. What's up? <laughs> there's something happening. Um, and this uh, aspect of clinging we sometimes have with sensual desire. Uh, sometimes sensual desire can also be broken up into material desire. When we buy something, we don't want to ruin it. We don't want to break it. We don't want to change what it is that we've purchased or we've um uh, brought into our uh, claiming of. Um, and sometimes with this, the clinging is not actually with the object itself, but the actual uh, representation that the object has, right? The aspect of newness, the aspect of what the material goods means to us. Uh, if we cling on to too much, it can bring us heartache and unhappiness. 
In Buddhism, we also talk about the aspect of clinging onto views, perspectives, statuses, uh, what we see in also politics and social media, right? The aspect that things have to be a certain way, that there is a righteousness of being. Um, we also see clinging showing up as this desire, this necessity to be right, that somehow our views have to be on top, right? But what's also fascinating is in this aspect of clinging, also, if anyone has questions, feel free to ping it into chat too. I have that running as well. Um, this aspect of self-righteousness and also the duality with not enoughness, these extreme ends also we can form this type of clinging that brings us pain and um, dissatisfaction on the angle of self-righteousness, right? We have people clinging on to this aspect where I'm the boss, I'm right, I have to be 100% my way or the highway, right? Or conversely, in not enoughness, we can have this clinging and this attachment to being so imperfect, being not enough, and bringing it into our practice, right? And sometimes when we, for example, sit in meditation, we sit in and cling on to this aspect where my meditation isn't enough, the way I'm posturing isn't enough, the what I am practicing and what I am thinking is somehow not enough. And therefore, if I'm not enough, then I must be doing something right because it is the practice in itself, right? And aligned with that, we also see this other aspect of clinging, which is again around rules and ritual. So the evolution of these perspectives. And in Buddhism, it is around this aspect of having a right way to do something. Uh, we see this showing up as having certain daily rituals, but sometimes we can cling on to these daily rituals as a part of too muchness, right? Which is a meditation. And sometimes um, what I also love to do as a practice of meditation is just seeing what fits with everyone and the practice that they need. Uh, but what we sometimes see with certain uh, intro practitioners is this aspect where when they learn meditation, like it has to be a certain way, right? I'm sure we've been there uh, where we're like, I have to sit on the mat two hours a day. And uh, we cling on to so much expecting somehow it's going to bring enlightenment, but the actual moving away from some of that does. And you're like, how does this make sense? Uh, <laughs> uh, and also aligned with rules and rituals, we see um, sometimes this sacrifice of just being in the moment. And I think the beautiful part of Buddhism is, or even just this practice of awareness is being with the present, Right. And sometimes this aspect of codifying certain practices beyond uh, the means of being present in the present moment is when we lean and index too much on the past or the future. And so the same thing goes for the meditation practice is um, really the practice is about bringing us to the present tense, right? And when we become so enamored with what it had done or what it could do, that's when Buddhists uh, and Buddhism practice says this, we're starting to uh, cling on to things. And um, lastly, the fourth aspect of clinging, uh, this belief in personality, belief in self, uh, this one's quite fascinating um, where uh, if you read it in Buddhist scriptures and uh, lineages and practice, Buddha has never really defined this practice of um, self as a, something that exists and there um, is no aspect of self that isn't. So it's also, also this like aspect where self doesn't really exist. Um, and um, in Mahayana practice, they have this quite fascinating, uh, one of the lineages of Buddhism where they'll just poke at things very analytically and uh, what their challenge in that practice is um, being able to actually pinpoint the self, right? They're like, where is actually the self? And they'll go, is self here? Is self here? Is self here? Um, uh, and they're, they're challenging always. If you have this belief where self exists, they're like, point to it, right? I won't get too deep into there. But going back to the aspect of clinging is where we start attributing the aspect of self as a codified 
being a codified entity, a codified object, and that when we cling on to it so heavily, uh, that's where in Buddhists uh, practice or in Buddhism, we're going to start uh, setting us up for disappointment or pain or dukkha. Um, especially when uh, we're in the moment, right? Oh, what's another way to describe it? But when sense of self uh, overtakes us is let's say somebody was rude to us at the grocery store, right? And we're starting to attribute what they're doing as onto us, right? We're saying they are rude to me. Um, how could I be um, at the center of this rudeness? How could this happen to me? And this fourth pillar is just basically saying that um, there's nothing that really happened aside from they are just. Um, practicing rude behaviors, that there wasn't actually a me involved as a part of that practice, right? Um, there are a lot of other ways that the Buddha will talk about this aspect of clinging, but um, sometimes they use in Buddhist practices and scriptures um, different fables to kind of just help to bring it to life. And um, this probably is one that a lot of you all have heard, um, where uh, basically there's these two monks uh, going and walking down a river bend, and uh, they meet this river that has a very fast current, right? And in the current and the shore of it, they meet this beautiful, beautiful young woman. Um, and sometimes in these fables, I'm like, I don't know why they have to attribute certain genders to it. And I'm just like, just imagine a young and uh, beautiful person. And um, basically the person asks Buddhist monks, hey, can you help me cross? And these two monks uh, in particular, peculiar we're looking at each other going well we're not supposed to necessarily um, as a part of our vows touch a woman touch a femme individual and uh without a doubt um one of the monk picked up the woman carried her across the river and uh, uh led through this treacherous journey um going all the way through the water and all the way to the other end and crossing it on the other side and arrived and uh Placed her down. And the young monk looking at this couldn't believe what happened. Um, and as he is also uh, crossing the water and the treacherous rivers and going through the uh, river bend and going to the other side, was quite speechless and uh, couldn't believe what happened, especially as they looked at each other. Um, saying oh look, this isn't a part of our practice and so as they would walk together one hour would pass two hours would pass and finally after many hours would pass the younger monk was just like i have to get this off of my chest and uh basically asked the older monk uh how could you have carried that uh woman on your shoulders um one we shouldn't have done this as a part of a practice because this is what we had vowed um, as a part of being a monk. But two, wasn't she heavy? Um, just how could you have even done this visibly? Um, and uh, the older monk basically looks at the younger monk and said, uh, I had actually put her down on the other side of the river. Uh, why are you still carrying her with you? Uh, in your thoughts, basically. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of this attributes to this weight and these things that we carry with us through life. And sometimes um, when we go through, going back to the analogy of the grocery store, even though the event, right, somebody may have looked at us peculiarly or somebody had said something to us, and maybe they are not with us physically, we still carry them with us in an aspect of us clinging onto them uh, with us through the days, through the weeks. Um, and sometimes this could happen with those we love, right? Somebody we love may have said something that may not have brushed us right the right way. And we carry 
not them with us this entire time, but this remnant of who they were, what they had said through with us, through not just hours, not just days, but sometimes weeks and months, right? Uh, the Buddha says, whatever is not ours, we must let go of it. Letting go will be for our long-term happiness and benefit. What is not ours, form is not ours. Uh, that's referring to the body. Uh, feeling is not ours. Feelings come and go. They are impermanent. We do not own them. They are not who we are. Perception is not ours. The way we observe things, our reaction to it. Fabrications are not ours. These mental formations, the way we interpret things, our thoughts. And even this aspect of consciousness is not ours. And when we let go of all of it, we can let go and bring in this aspect of long-term happiness and benefit. And in a lot of the practices that we see today and how we bring this aspect of um, moving away from uh, clinging, non-clinging, we see uh, bringing forth uh, our aspect of liberation. And what I want to share is the way in which I practice non-clinging, and at least something that had clicked for me was this also practice of impermanence, which is this aspect that nothing is forever. Um, uh, in uh, Pali, they call it anicca. And Basically, this is saying that what we observe, whether it's metaphorical or whether it's physical, is that it's always changing. Um, and uh, in more specific terms, they have this way of describing it of gross versus subtle impermanence. And gross is something that we can observe that we change, right? Um, if we put in uh, a calculator, one, two, three, four, the gross change, the gross impermanence is the screen has flickered and changed, right? When we're on the apps, on our phones, we type in some stuff, things change immediately, right? Uh, when we drop a cup, it shatters into a bunch of pieces. Um, we see gross change immediately, right? And subtle change, subtle impermanence is things that change over time, but it isn't visible immediately to our eye, right? This is uh, when we get older, right? <laughs> when we get grow and uh, we get grow, we grow up. Um, uh, we, when we look in the mirror, we don't immediately notice um, this change as we uh, grow or we shrink in height, maybe, um, uh, we might, the zip that formed might, might be a gross impermanence, but these other larger changes throughout the span of our lives, right? Uh, the gray hairs that form, the height changes, um, or just us as a being shifting, uh, that is subtle in, impermanence. Another example is the walls of the buildings all around us, right? Um, over time in architecture, we see parts crumbling, but immediately we don't notice the change, right? Which is the gross change, but it is subtle impermanence over time in a hundred years, 200 years, the walls around us may not last. Right. And the same thing could be applied to as you even just look around, look around you right now, right beyond your computer screen, you might notice things that might have gross change where if we pick it up and we drop it immediately, things would change. Right. But there might be just things that we had thought that would be around us forever may not be around, let's say in a hundred years, right? 200 years, even us, people, objects, right? Um, but what we also refer impermanence to could go beyond the means of these objects, but also thought, idea, right? Um, and sometimes these live more in the subtle impermanence territory where um, things change over time slightly, um, things around political beliefs, ideologies, things around acceptance, openness. Um, we see that things are always in shifting motion, momentum. And what I love about this aspect of impermanence is if impermanence exists, right, then what are we actually clinging on to, right? And sometimes we cling on to things that our emotion as a part of, right, again, familiarity, a uh, moment in time, an aspect of 
uh, what it brought us, right? Again, those four aspects of Buddhism, um, breaking it down, but sometimes we might be enamored with a part of what we have built this relationship to, right? Where we are at a moment in time, we're just in love with, and that's what we become clinging to. Um, but really this aspect, at least what finally clicked for me of how do I become more open to non-clinging is really embracing the truth of um, impermanence and how it changes. Uh, I was in a retreat uh, in, where was I? Over in Thailand once, practicing um, their lineage of Theravada Buddhism. And this is where they were trying to teach this aspect of impermanence. And I was just like having trouble resonating with it. Um, and I was sitting with this monk who uh, had claimed to be enlightened. <laughs> and it's one of those things that uh, if people claim to be enlightened, they might not be enlightened. But regardless, uh, this monk claimed to be enlightened and was going on this spiel in one of his Dharma talks about how he had finally embraced this aspect of impermanence and how as he was getting older and seeing all the people uh, die and pass around him that he was okay with it. He's like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Everything will come and go. And in talking about accepting impermanence, this was a moment in which I was trying to learn about this aspect of impermanence, right? Understanding people, the people we love and that we care about is also impermanent and that will not be around forever. We won't be around forever, right? And when I was hearing this uh, in practice for the first time, I was struggling with it. I was like, oh, I hear you, but I struggle with it because the friends I have around me, my family around me, I adore them. And I, I struggle to not have this clinging to them because this clinging is love that I have for them, right? And I was like, how can I not feel attached to them? And it wasn't until I sat with this nun um, uh, in India uh, in this aspect of, uh, in this teaching of Mahayana Buddhism, of just uh, bringing more curiosity, open-ended curiosity into practice, where she had verbally verbalized, it isn't really this lovingness that is this clinging, this holding, but loving as an act of release. I love you so much that I am open to what you will become. I love you so much as this larger entity uh, that is far beyond my comprehension and awareness that I accept you for in your physical manifestation. I accept you for your non-physical manifestation um, that I become open to. And so I love this reframe because sometimes this allows me to not just within this personhood, right? I can apply it to objects. I can apply it to things that I can embrace change because it is far greater than we might even have awareness at this current moment that, um, that that change and the shift and this ebb and flow of nature of things thoughts objects uh can go far beyond our awareness of things um and over the years i've uh, had um friends pass and i uh, i think one after another, it just uh, yeah, is never easy. And also, uh, when I was much younger, uh, my father had passed uh, when I was about seven years old. And for many years, um, especially teaching about grief um, and teaching about um, clinging, right? Uh, we we don't do for the youth and and for people who. Um, we're much younger. Um, and sometimes we're, we're teaching as a part of this love that to love is to cling. Um, and I think as a part of this practice of honoring people, honoring people that I have known, I have loved, um, going back to the reframe of the nun, but this beautiful reframe of maybe this impermanence, uh, impermanence of those we love and those that have come into our lives and are far beyond now of this physical self, we can honor them, we can love them 
far beyond this physical manifestation. We can love the things that they've brought into our lives, whether it's the memories, whether it's the feelings, and we can live life in honoring this entity that's far greater than um, this physical manifestation. Um, and I think as we look at going back to clinging and maybe how it goes beyond just ourselves and those we love, but even just society as we see it today, uh, there's this argument, right, where people will say, do we, do we have a lot of this dissonance and this vitriol in society today because we, we um, are just not in a good place or are these thoughts just bubbling up and we're uh, pressuring one another to uh, basically be at these polarities? Personally, I think that these have all existed in this ecosystem that we have, but we are, I think, more connected than ever. And that things that may have not been online or might not have had a platform have a space to uh, spew uh, onto uh, just the <laughs> openness that we have. And, uh, and we see this, right? We see this clinging, this this latching onto these theories and theologies, capitalism, gender binaries, heteronormativity, racism, patriarchy. And, and I think personally, my practice over the past few years has been sitting with a lot of discomfort with it, right? Uh, like, ah, uh, how is this possible? How can we have this? And also clinging onto, and, and this practice, right? Uh, this clinging onto this aspect that somehow everyone has to have already gone through this journey and have been enlightened and and this clinging onto this aspect that everything should be perfect why are we facing this right um realizing maybe there is an opportunity to invite in impermanence into this processes realizing that maybe there is a separation of my work, their work, and especially with a lot of the work that we do in our nonprofit organization right now has a lot of um, uh, ties with just uh, activism, uh, change, uh, liberatory movements, and sometimes the work can get really heavy, right? And a big part of a practice has been also drawing a line of where one's work ends and where work begins for others. And I kind of want to bring this back to this aspect of also impermanence and clinging, and um, especially for those of us in this space, right? Um, those of us who don't identify with gender binaries, heteronormativity, um, we see a lot of the stuff that others may not be able to see because they're so deeply entrenched with many of these systems and and um, polarities and and with it a blessing and a curse sometimes right um, but I think with it sometimes uh, especially in sitting with the flow of impermanence and sometimes letting go of this clinging right in this activism and this pain that sometimes it can hold us or, or bring for us. Um, it is sitting in with the impermanence of others, opening up to how others may be in the future. It can change, it can be malleable. Um, and also the impermanence of even a society and a future beyond us that could be radically different, radically more positive, more accepting, more beautiful um, than we're more aware of. Um, the heavy, heavy asterisk I will put is, um, I think where one's work ends and others begin is uh, a little bit different, especially when it comes to safety, physical safety, um, emotional safety. And I think, um, especially when we have an opportunity to intervene differently, the heavy, heavy asterisk here is, um, I think, different cases and different scenarios but just broadly speaking i think there are so many 
of these practices of observing what we're clinging on to, opening up to non-clinging and opening up to these practices of impermanence and movement and flow that can also go hand in hand with how we approach uh, liberation, liberatory movements, activism, and ushering in uh, a, a world, a, a way of life, and a way of thinking, believing that um, we haven't experienced before. Um, and what I want to just end uh, this talk with is uh, just two um, notes uh, from W.E.B. Dubois around this aspect of freedom being an aspect of also state of mind, that that freedom is within ourselves. And that uh, especially uh, in this work and in society and media, when it may be really heavy, that is an opportunity to reflect, go into ourselves and see what teachings are all around us and what may come up uh, in meditation and sitting with uh, maybe some of the stuff that uh, is a bit difficult to do um, at times. And then uh, the late Thich Nhat Han has said uh, that letting go gives us freedom, freedom being the only condition for happiness. Uh, if in our heart we still cling onto anything, uh, whether it be anger, anxiety, or possessions, we ultimately cannot be freed. And to be freed is within us, and within us is also a liberation that we're seeking. And so, yeah, that's it for that. Um, I know we're at 748, and I had a quick meditation. So we have two options. Um, we can either uh, do a quick meditation, close it out, or we could do also a quick Q&A as well. Yeah. Or we'll do, you know what? I think there's like a lot of thoughts, a lot of things. I almost just want, like wanted to settle. And so let's do a quick meditation. Yeah. I'm just like sitting in with, a lot of those things that um, just came up as just thoughts. And so <sighs> bring yourself to a nice, comfortable, seated position, um, wherever you are. Um, breathing in, breathing out at a cadence that works best for you. And as you feel tension, breathing in or breathing out, feel free to breathe in, breathe out in the tempo that works for you. And in our talk today, we talked a bit about this aspect of clinging, impermanence, and what I want to invite is a sense of curiosity, emotionally or even physically, what's coming up for you right now? Maybe it's a bit of fatigue. It's been late for some folks, maybe on the East Coast. Maybe a bit of insight. Maybe it's a bit of dissonance where maybe some thoughts came up where you're like, hmm, interesting. And opening up to curiosity in our meditation, see if you can hold space, putting aside any commentary or judgments or need to solve anything per se, but maybe bringing a sense of openness, a sense of curiosity. What is arising for you? Is it pleasant, unpleasant, neither? 
and observe the thoughts that's coming up. Is there a relationship to what's coming up? Do you feel a propensity to want to cling onto those or pushing away, resisting? What's coming up for you? And in this exercise, sometimes I like to ask myself, your thoughts, things that are arising, what are you here to teach me more about myself, others, my relationships, And what are you here to teach me more about what I need at this moment? Notice as you bring some curiosity to it, is there a shift happening? with your mind, heart, body. What does this awareness feel when you have genuine openness? Curiosity, being free from judgment. Mm. Maybe put a hand on where your heart is, your right hand. Mm. Bring a bit of gentleness into your practice. And sometimes what I like to do is with the other hand, we say that our second heart is our gut, our stomach. Sometimes I like to do a double caressing, one hand over our heart, one hand over our stomach. Allow yourself to give unto yourself a bit of gentleness and compassion. with this practice. And finally, bringing your awareness back to yourself. your body, your breathing. What's one last thought that's coming up for you? One last message for yourself tonight, lesson. It could be a, a single word you take away for tonight. Mm. With that, feel free to bring a bit of wiggle into your hand and feel free to rub your hands together to bring a bit of awakeness back into your body. Let your eyes open and mm, you're back into the space. <laughs> Awesome. So I have a few minutes. If you have any questions, thoughts, 
Um, ready to sleep? <laughs> yes. Before everyone bombards Stephen with questions, I just wanted to put uh, his Dana PayPal in the chat. He's downloading this Dharma that's 2,600 years old in a new, amazing style that includes all of us. So just want to thank you for that. Yes, of course. And then also alternatively, let me drop this as Donna. Um, we run a nonprofit organization. Um, oh, let me do the... If anyone wants to donate, uh, organization empowers queer BIPOC creatives to break into the design industry uh, through some of these practice of mindful liberation and practices. And so um, if folks want to donate their dana towards there as well, we accept donations and funding to help empower our communities. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, anyone have any comments, thoughts? What did what came up for you? Uh, <laughs> I could I could say something like yeah. in your communities as we come back together after COVID, I'm noticing uh, quite a lot of drama. And it, and it made me think of that woman across the river, like how like us as queers just love the drama, not all of us. Well, we have different relationships, but I just wondered if you had any insight around that post COVID and stories. And... Yes, yes, yes. I feel like it's a good, it's a good fable. And sometimes I carry people too long <laughs> I, I leave people at the river <laughs> um uh sometimes uh and 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 i think there's a shift in my practice where um i i i was thinking so much about the um what am i going to do in carrying these people with us right versus the why Am I carrying them still with me? And I think um, the question that always helps me to just kind of snap out and get out of my own mind is just asking in this relationship that I have with maybe who I'm carrying with me in my headspace, what does this have to teach me more about myself? What do I need at this moment? What can I learn from it? Um, and I think I'm going back to just like society and um, the communities and, and drama, one might say. Um, I, I think the thing to also just um, just sit with too is especially our media uh, cycles, right? Have become faster than ever. Is fueled by a lot of drama. Is fueled by a lot of news that gets a lot of clicks and very clickbaity most of the time. And I think, especially for folks who find yourself in the um, in the vortex of social media and news, my recommendation is always just see if you could take a break. Um, see if you could just take a step away for the time being and what i always say is if there's news that's important enough to surface up into your communities sometimes it might just show up in ways that's necessary um and sometimes a breakaway could be what's needed and especially more than ever um i think we have a commodification of our attention as a community and um one activist teacher has really helped me, especially in um, looking at the energy that we could put into the world, right? We have, let's just say a cup just of so much water, we can decide to pour that energy and that water towards those that antagonize us, or we can pour them straight back into our communities 
and really support those that help us. And again, heavy asterisks, I think when it comes to um, intervention with uh, against physical and emotional harm, I think that's one thing. But I think if you also find yourself or see how you're allocating, right, this one cup that you have, where is it flowing into, I think um, can be a good uh, a way to see um, how you're also uh, holding space for yourself in your communities. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, yes, to your point, uh, drama around uh, COVID, the epidemic, and there's just so much happening. Um, I think we can hold space for ourselves and also the world in two hands, right? And I think there can be work for us to do onto ourselves and the relationship we have with all of these things that's happening. Um, and to, what is it in, in, in airlines, when you fly, they always say, put your mask on, right? Before others it is how do you um, create that space of self-compassion, of healing, of rest uh, before um, moving on to others. And the analogy, um, and Kim here is a wonderful, beautiful practitioner. And we always check in with ourselves, uh, with both of us in the practice, uh, but we always remind ourselves, uh, you can't warm the communities or others around us by setting ourselves on fire. <laughs> I think we said this last year, right? <laughs> when we sat together. And sometimes when we sit in communities, we are lighting ourselves on fire to keep everyone warm. <laughs> and um, it, uh, a big part of activism is also sustainability. If there's stuff that we are doing that is not sustainable in practice, it is not something that we can continue forth, right? For not just decades, but hundreds of years, right? And so um, maybe that's a little nugget that I'll put down of just how to navigate drama. <laughs> yeah.